Good afternoon and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board. And we're going to start this uh, afternoon's meeting with the Executive Director's Report, Susan Barrett. Thank you, Chair Mullen. I have a few announcements. Uh, first, I want to announce a couple of public comments that are ongoing. Um, one is a special public comment period for the board's vital guidance, uh, budget guidance, and that is posted on our website. Those comments are due back by close of business, April 9th. And then another public comment that has been open um, for quite some time and will continue to be open is any public comment um, regarding a subsequent all pair model agreement. As I've mentioned before, uh, the Director of Healthcare Reform has presented to our um, general advisory as well as our primary care advisory group and the slides are listed on our website. And we ask that if anyone has any comments on that subsequent all payer model agreement, uh, we would love to hear from you. And of course, are sharing those comments with uh, our partners at AHS who will be taking the lead on a subsequent all payer model agreement. Um, then the other updates I have is just in terms of our schedule. So we're hearing today from uh, our staff on a, a report that we uh, submitted on Section 4 of Act 159, Susta Sustainability um, and Equitable Reimbursement for Providers in Vermont. Next week, we'll be hearing um, from a, board, a, a staff member, um, Elena Barabi, on our sustainability planning update that we submitted to the legislature on April 1st, and that is Section 5 of Act 159. And then in addition, we've invited the Director of Healthcare Reform to come in, come in Ina Bacchus, to come in and update all of um, the board and public on their progress on the AHS all-payer ACO model in, uh, improvement plan. And that is all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of Wednesday, March 31st. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, March 31st without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Let the record show that the minutes were approved unanimously. And now as um, our executive director just discussed, we're going to turn to a discussion of Section 5 of Act 159 of 2020. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to Elena Barabee and Sarah Kensler. So whenever the two of you are ready, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, and I will just share my screen right now. So hopefully you can all see um, the projected slides and only the projected slides. Looks like you can. We're good. All right. Fantastic. Um, so for the record, this is Sarah Kinsler, uh, Director of Strategy and Operations at the Board. And Elena Verby, Director of Health Systems Finance, or sorry, Health Systems Policy at the Board. Uh, and we are here to present on uh, options for regulating provider reimbursement as required in Act 159 of 2020, Section 5. Um, this report was submitted to the legislature on March 15th uh, and is available on the Legislative Reports web page. We've also included um, a link on the front page of this document. Um, so, and, and I just also want to mention that we've um, been into Senate Health and Welfare twice now to present the report contents and we'll be returning there tomorrow. So this is definitely a current conversation at the legislature. Um, before we jump into the report contents, um, I just want to give a shout out to the whole team that worked uh, with us to develop this report because this was definitely um, a, a major undertaking uh, and a big group effort. Um, so within the Green Mountain Care Board, that was Sarah Tewksbury, um, Christina McLaughlin, uh, Marissa Melamed, uh, board member Lunge. Um, and I also just want to uh, thank 
our partners at the Agency of Human Services, at DIVA, at DFR, uh, and the private sector stakeholders who weighed in on this report as well. Um, we could not have done it without all of them. Um, so we wanted to ground our discussion today in the statute that directed the board to develop this report. Um, uh, and, and that's here on the screen. I won't read it for you. But um, as you know, there have been several reports on provider reimbursements relating to pay parity across care settings or provider sites over the past uh, five years or so. Um, the idea behind this report is to take a look at the range of options for regulating provider reimbursement um, with pros, cons, um, implementation issues, and costs for standing up this type of regulation at the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and, and there are a couple of key points that we want to lead off with um, when, when we are presenting this to you. Um, so this report presents regulatory options, not recommendations. Um, we really strived to um, present a range of policy options uh, for the legislature to consider and to present the pros and cons of each fairly. Um, to date, we've worked hard to be neutral um, when we've discussed this report in the legislature as well, in part because the board has not yet had a chance to discuss the options or express um, an opinion or opinions. Um, secondly, while we worked to lay these options out in, in practical terms, including uh, funding and staffing estimates for initial development and implementation, as well as ongoing operations, all of the options that we are going to present to you today um, would require further study. We, we describe likely avenues for this in the full report, um, but we, we really want to highlight that none of these are, um, are, are fully are, are fully baked yet, uh, and, and they would all require significant um, in investment in study. Uh, in addition, we want to note that the inclusion of public payers in any of these regulatory approaches would require federal permissions, and it's kind of a, another area to, to consider and investigate further. Uh, and finally, we, um, we identified a tension between the goals uh, that are stated in the statute of provider sustainability and reimbursement equity, as well as other goals Vermont and the board have previously stated, including cost containment, the shift to value-based care, consumer affordability, and access to care. Um, no single option can maximize all of these goals. And while the options kind of can be combined and layered, this will add expense and complexity. So you'll see that we come back to this theme of, of tension uh, and, and we'll end the presentation today with a list of key questions we're asking when we're at the legislature. Um, we need to make sure that we prioritize these goals before we can really refine our options. Um, so while, while these options are likely consistent with provider-led delivery system reform, we also want to note that they, um, uh, they may compete with provider-led payment reform and, and, and also could complement it in some instances. So we're kind of uh, we're, we're aware of the variety of these tensions and, and are hoping to have a robust discussion there. So that's a very high level summary of key points. Uh, and now we're going to provide a little bit of background and context before we talk options. Um, when approaching this report, we really started from the current context, specifically the federal and state commitment to moving toward value-based care. Um, we also want to note that related to value-based care, this report only looks at the cost side of the equation, and it doesn't really get into quality or outcome measurement and regulation. These areas should be considered as next steps should the legislature um, you know, choose to move forward with, with funding these efforts, and we hope will be part of the ongoing conversation. Um, so... In terms of that context, uh, the federal government across three administrations now um, has expressed support on a bipartisan basis for moving away from fee-for-service healthcare payment and toward value-based care. Um, while the Biden administration uh, has not yet discussed their approach in depth, we don't expect that um, to change given some of their appointment choices. Um, you know, we have we have a federal HHS secretary um, confirmed recently, and Elizabeth Fowler was appointed this month as the director of CMMI. Um, which does not require Senate confirmation. So we'd expect to hear more in the coming weeks or, or months um, as their kind of leadership gets up, up to speed. And then Vermont's move toward value-based payment. Uh, as many of you know, Vermont has been, well, and as the board certainly knows, um, Vermont has been on this path away from fee-for-service and toward value-based care for many years in alignment with and often ahead of the federal government. Um, and that includes uh, programs like the Blueprint, Blueprint for Health and Community Health Teams, um, the State Innovation Model Grant, uh, and the all payer model. Um, we really tried to drive home that a key policy consideration for the legislature will be to think about how implementation of provider reimbursement regulation um, will or could impact the move to value-based care, both in terms of timing and in terms of capacity for change at the provider and payer level and at the state level. 
now I hand it over to Elena. Great, thank you, Sarah. Um, so just uh, kind of at a high level, um, you know, one of the goals of the state and uh, directive of the Green Mountain Care Board is to assist in controlling healthcare spending across the state. If you break down total healthcare spending, there's kind of two key components that we look at. One is the unit cost or price, and the other is utilization. Our all-payer model is really focused on tackling the second um, component, utilization, by changing the way that we pay and deliver healthcare. We hope to see you know, fewer chronic conditions over time and more prevention and keeping people healthy. Um, this report really focuses on unit costs. That doesn't mean that these options may not affect utilization. They may, and some of them actually do more than others. Um, but the focus here is controlling healthcare spending through controlling the unit cost or price. Can you go to the next slide? Okay, so to dig in a little deeper into the legislative um, language here, so it's really about identifying processes for um, improving provider sustainability and increasing equity and reimbursement. Um, and then we thought most importantly within the context of value-based care that has been such a major component of um, healthcare reform in this state and you know federally as well as Sarah just discussed. Um, and that, you know, we also take into consideration care settings, Medicare payment methodologies, payer mix, and other um, and very important characteristics for, for fleshing these, these objectives out. In the next slide. So, you know, we thought it would be helpful to define um, these components uh, so we have something to kind of anchor back to as we propose um, or kind of outline a series of options and, and think about how they could further these uh, policy goals or, or not. Um, so value-based care we define broadly as the economic or efficient and economic delivery of high quality care. So does the option move us away from fee for service, address utilization issues and promote services um, that improve health as opposed to, uh, you know, or avoiding spending that does not improve health. Um, the, for provider financial sustainability, um, it's really about the provider's ability to consistently cover their expenditures with revenue. Um, so does this option include a provider level look for solvency and consider payer mix and promote predictable and flexible revenue streams to providers? And so this is really important when thinking about whether or not, um, you know, it's not just your income statement, but also thinking about capital expenditures over the long term. So thinking about sustainability needs to be um, over a long time horizon and not perhaps on an annual basis as we're used to thinking about. Uh, reimbursement equity, similarly, we took a pretty broad stroke at this without further um, guidance in the, le in the legislative language. Um, so we defined it as equitable payment within and across provider types for care delivery. Uh, so does this option address underlying fee-for-service differentials within certain provider types um, or, uh, you know, or move away from site-specific reimbursement, or does it address kind of across uh, provider type differentials, so between different kind of service sectors, if you will, uh, like, for example, primary care and specialty care. Okay, can move to the next slide. So I think Sarah highlighted this a little bit, but these tensions that exist. So there's, you know, not always, but sometimes a tension between provider sustainability and reimbursement equity. Um, so she mentioned no single option maximizes both of these, and some of these could be addressed by layering on um, some of the proposed um, or the outlined uh, policy options, um, but that does add complexity and potentially regulatory burden. Um, so, you know, this report contemplates the ability of each option to address each of these statutory goals within the context of value-based care, but could be refined um, further. So these, the, what we're presenting today is really the high level. There are um, even more nuanced options within these high level options that could, could vary um, on, on this front as well. Okay, go to the next slide. So we thought it also important to bring forth kind of two other policy goals that are always kind of circulating in the background and also very important to consider, though not called out in the legislative language explicitly, and that's affordability and access. Um, so while we didn't kind of focus on that for the purpose of this report, um, you know, it is important to remember that, you know, provider reimbursement methodologies will likely impact access and affordability. Um, we did not dig into that, but that is certainly work that could be done. Um, so, you know, while provider reimbursement could have an impact, provider reimbursement alone probably is not likely to solve these really complex issues either. So that's another kind of element. So while intertwined, um, 
you know, it won't, it won't push it one way or the other. Okay. Back to Sarah. So, so now before we get into the options, um, we wanted to kind of set the stage by providing some background on how we have been thinking about provider reimbursement. Um, there are two primary kind of bases that sit at the foundation of provider reimbursement on which payment models are built. Um, the first is cost-based, where reimbursement amounts are based on the provider's historical cost to provide a service or a set of services. Uh, and here, prices are based on actual expenses, sometimes blended with that of a peer group or otherwise adjusted. But the biggest example here is Medicare reimbursement for critical access hospitals, which is based on each hospital's historical costs because Medicare recognizes that these hospitals are serving a uh, few patients and not enough to pay for ongoing infrastructure. Um, and, oops, excuse me. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the other kind of base for re reimbursement is fee-for-service, where reimbursement amounts are set based on negotiated amounts, whether those are based on market rates, historic amounts, uh, or reference payer, or some other, some other set of criteria. Uh, fee-for-service rates are unrelated to the actual cost of providing services, so they could be more than the expenses associated with providing a particular service, or they could be uh, far less. Um, either can be rolled up into more complex payment models like per diem rates, episode-based payments, or global budgets. And these bases for reimbursement can also be layered with payment strategies um, with the goals of improving quality and or controlling spending growth, excuse me, and or controlling spending growth. Uh, these include uh, growth targets or caps, which limit growth trends. It also could include value-based value -based models, which reward or penalize providers based on performance on cost and quality and or population-based payment models. Um, so then how we're thinking about regulating provider reimbursement. Um, we define this as government action to set provider reimbursement methodologies and amounts, which can be implemented either via provider regulation at either the provider or the entity level uh, or at the service level, or through insurance regulation by setting parameters for payer provider negotiations. Um, currently, reimbursement amounts and methodologies are most commonly negotiated between commercial payers and providers in their networks, or they're set by public payers for providers participating in their programs. Um, left to the market, uh, negotiations can be influenced by relative bargaining power and market share. And we also want to note um, that where there's an ACO or ACOs, uh, that's an additional kind of set of negotiations to set methodologies and amounts. So to, to drill down a little bit further into those regulatory approaches, um, we, we're laying them out here. Uh, the first two columns are provider uh, regulatory strategies, and approach three is the insurance regulation-based strategy. Um, and I'm just going to kind of walk us through this table so you can see how we have been thinking about this as we lay out the options and sub-options in the report. Um, uh, approach one, entity or provider-based regulation, sets reimbursement policy for the provider entity based on provider-specific characteristics. Uh, a great example of this is our current hospital budget review process, uh, which looks at expected revenue and expenses for each provider organization individually. Um, the trade-offs here are that this individual view uh, supports a really strong focus on um, sustainability and can also balance factors like payer mix when considering equity. Um, however, if equity is defined as paying the same amount for the same service, it's hard to achieve because it's so provider specific. Um, providers have different expenses and unique circumstances that are considered in this view. Uh, this can also be really hard to scale to provider types with large numbers of unique organizations. So in Vermont, we do this for 14 hospitals. If we were to do this for you know, every um, practice in the state, um, that would be much more challenging because we'd be looking at you know, hundreds of organizations probably. Um, in addition, this potentially captures a broad population since it's Im implemented through provider regulation, which regulates how providers charge for their services rather than how payers pay. Um, secondly, approach number two is a uh, service-based regulation. A hypothetical example here might be that payments for primary care services have to increase by X percent in a particular year. Uh, the trade-offs here is that the, this approach um, is very compatible with a reimbursement equity focus because it sets reimbursement uh, policy for a service type, regardless of where it's delivered or what kind of uh, provider organization delivers it. Um, however, it can't consider sustainability in a particularly nuanced way because it doesn't look at individual organizations. And as we said, kind of the individual factors like um, payer mix or population served or size or anything like that. Um, like the entity or provider level approach we just walked through, it also has the potential to capture a broader population, uh, depending on the services that it's impacting. 
And finally, the third approach, insurer or payer-based um, regulation. And here we're setting policy through the insurance market. So the hypothetical example is requiring GMCB regulated commercial plans uh, to increase payments for primary care services by X percent in a year. Um, the trade-offs here is that it's a much smaller population, a subset of the commercial market, um, which is limiting in, in Vermont because our insurance market is small, about 94, or our insured market, excuse me, is small, about 94,000 people, um, which wouldn't, and it wouldn't reach self-insured employers. Um, we also can't consider sustainability in a nuanced way with this strategy, um, and reimbursement equity uh, is also limited. That kind of focus is also limited because the population is so small. Uh, an offsetting limitation uh, would also have to be made in other services if we're kind of increasing uh, increasing payment in one area uh, if we want to have cost neutrality for premiums. So in plainer language, um, if you choose to increase one provider sector or type of service and don't uh, decrease somewhere else, premiums will rise, which we know um, is you know an ongoing concern. Um, so now I am going to hand it over to, oh, actually, never mind. I'm not going to hand it over to Elena. I'm going to talk through the report development process, and then we'll move on to the options. Um, so before we dig into those policy options, uh, just a little bit of background on the de report development process and scope. Um, we developed the options by researching known examples and scanning the literature for regulatory approaches and state examples. And we really tried to capture um, a range, uh, as I said earlier, including adapting current uh, GMCB regulatory processes and envisioning new regulatory approaches using or expanding on our current authorities. Uh, Act 159 directed the board to engage with the Director of Healthcare Reform at the Agency of Human Services, uh, the Department of Vermont Health Access, uh, and the Department of Financial Regulation. And we did so multiple times as we developed the report, including reviewing drafts with those state partners. And we got incredibly helpful feedback throughout this process. Um, we also took the opportunity to share the draft report with potentially regulated entities and advocates in early March and solicited comments. And that included um, BAS, Health First, Bi State, um, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, MVP, VMS, the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, as well as a member of the public who requested to join. And again, we got incredibly helpful feedback through that process. Um, so moving on to the scope, um, this report could have easily doubled in size and complexity if we had had um, more time and, and resourcing to develop it. But in order to make it, um, I wouldn't call the full report digestible, but in order to make it more digestible and hit our March 15th deadline, uh, we had to establish kind of some boundaries related to provider type services and payers. Uh, and, and, and we note in the report that we could um, dig in further to broaden or clarify the scope in subsequent analyses if, um, if we were directed to do so. Uh, the options discussed in this report really focus on regulating reimbursement for hospital inpatient, outpatient, and professional services, so primary care and specialty care services. Um, we have generally excluded providers for whom Medicaid is the dominant payer like designated agencies, for example, since the state already sets their payment rates and growth rates, and there's already significant infrastructure and expertise at, D at DIVA and other AHS departments that oversees these providers. Um, the report also excludes pharmacy, dental, and vision. As we discussed last week, the federal laws around reimbursement for, oh, excuse me, that's my note for myself from Senate Health and Welfare. Um, so we also wanted to note that the federal laws around reimbursement of FQHCs uh, really complicates inclusion of FQHCs in any of these regulatory models. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that these reimbursement models wouldn't work for FQHCs, but that would require a lot more explanation, uh, exploration and legal analysis to, to assess the potential. Uh, and on the payer side, we want to note that we really focused on options that impact reimbursement for Medicare, Medicaid, and fully insured commercial health plans in the individual small group uh, and large group markets. Um, we were not looking at other segments of the commercial market like Medicare Advantage, like Workers' Comp, uh, Federal Employee Health Plan, uh, or TRICARE. Uh, and we need to do more research for each option to determine how it would impact these market segments. Now I will hand it over to Elena to discuss the options. Great. Um, so there are three kind of primary options um, that we looked at, health systems budget, uh, setting reimbursement parameters, and fee-for-service rate setting. Um, and then we layered those various regulatory approaches um, on top of these options to kind of think about more nuanced ways of their, you know, how we would implement them um, or how they could be implemented. And we'll talk to those in more detail um, on the following slide. So we can go to the next slide. So the first one is health system budgets. 
Um, so this is a cap on spending for some portion of the healthcare system. So it could be a provider organization, a facility, or a network of providers. Um, generally, these, uh, these caps are set prospectively with a defined budget amount with enforcement mechanisms and usually a payment methodology. Um, so budgets can be all payer or payer specific. Um, and this is, you know, designed to impact total spending. And then there's some other um, kind of benefits or, you know, design options, if you will, depending on how you implement that. So two examples, which we'll talk about in a moment, are Maryland and Pennsylvania. Um, so, like I mentioned, there are these three regulatory approaches, provider or ACO or insurer. So while um, Maryland is really focused on the provider lens, Pennsylvania kind of comes from the insurer lens. And I think you could kind of think about our ACO process um, or ACO structure right now is moving towards a global budget. It's not quite there, but um, it could be, you know, designed in a similar way. So what are some uh, pros of this approach? Um, so this approach could help you tackle unit costs and utilization while, you know, considering value-based payments. Um, you know, the conflict between sustainability and cost containment, um, affordability in the regulated sector is another potential benefit. Um, and then impact of minimal reimbursement increases in the public payer sector. So you can think about how to, um, you know, balance um, across payers in this, in this vein. Um, so what are some issues that are hard to address with this approach? So the lack of market power for smaller or unregulated providers. So, um, you know, if you come from the, from the provider perspective, as Sarah mentioned before, you know, the greater number of providers you have, the, the harder this becomes because you're setting and regulating a budget of an individual provider. Um, and the administrative burden might be higher for those that, that enter kind of a regula regulated um, process. Um, the cost estimates are below, and so this is kind of um, one of the bigger, um, bigger ticket approaches because there's a lot of of layering and design that needs to happen, um, both for implementation and then ongoing, because um, you're not only looking at the, the aggregate, but prescribing the enforcement and the, the rate setting methodology. Um, but we can talk through some of the benefits um, as they're evident in, and, and the cons in the other two options. So we can go to the next slide, or in the two examples, rather. So Maryland. So Maryland, um, was started from a fee-for-service rate setting. They evolved to a global budget model in 2014 and then to an all-payer total cost of care model in 2019. Um, so in this model, they have, um, a, you know, some, similar to the board, the Maryland Health Services Cost Review Commission, um, and they set uh, these budgets annually, and then they set the rates for, for all payers um, and adjust those rates as utilization um, kind of occurs over the course of the year to adjust to that total budget. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, this is built on fee for service, so it's still in some sense, um, you know, relies on utilization, but what they found helpful was during COVID, they could adjust um, the prices in such a way that they could kind of help keep the hospital whole when they had, um, you know, lower utilization rates. One challenge they have seen with this though is precisely that fluctuation in prices. So if you go in one month, you could be paying, you know, 15, 20% more than if you went in, you know, for services in a subsequent month. Um, and we, we've heard anecdotally, I won't speak for Maryland, but that they are looking for ways to kind of fold in um, fixed payments into this methodology. Um, they do have, uh, you know, two waiver requirements as it relates to quality for Medicare um, hospital readmission rates. Um, and their potentially preventable diseases over the five um, years of the waiver. So, you know, it is, it, they have seen a lot of success in this so far. So they've uh, saved over 45 billion and, and lowered um, their growth rate from 25% above the U.S. average to 3% above the U.S. average. So that is quite remarkable. Um, it is more cost focused than it is sustainability focused, but I think COVID has um, shown or demonstrated that it is, it has lended a sustainability element to their um, to their state. So if we go to the next slide, so Pennsylvania, on the other hand, was aiming to solve a sustainability problem for rural hospitals, and they set up their global budget. And theirs is coming from the from the payer perspective um, first, and they do set you know it is facility based, but you know the budget is really set with the um, insurer side first. Um, so, you know, this one, 
they, they, it's, they still have this fee for service um, reconciliation to their fixed payment, but it's really about setting those fixed payments for providers over, I shouldn't say reconciliation, they use fee for service to establish that initial budget and then they have these growth rates year over year, um, but it is based on that fee for service, um, you know, historical look. I think one challenge they've had here is that it's voluntary in nature. So they had, I think, difficulty getting their regulatory board off the ground, but now that they have that up and going, um, you know, it is still voluntary. So it, it's taken a while to get moving, but they have seen, have seen more progress in, in the earliest and more recent days. So you can go to the next slide. So the second option is um, setting reimbursement parameters. Uh, so this is when, you know, we set um, a growth rate or a growth cap or uh, paired with a growth floor for a particular service or provider type um, aligned with state, it could be aligned with state policy goals. Um, so it's similar to the hospital budget process, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, and, you know, there are three regulatory approaches that, that could be adopted here. It could be provider, um, it could be service level or insurer based. Um, so, for example, payments for primary care services could be required to be increased by X percent over a period of time. Um, the thing to keep in mind here is that if we're thinking about um, affordability and the effect on premiums that, you know, for every increase um, to stay budget neutral, you would have to think about a decrease somewhere else. So that is, that is a concern, I think, in each of these options. Um, what, what could this help us um, address? Is prioritizing growth for certain types of providers or services that we want to see. So primary care is one area that we've talked about extensively. Um, and perhaps limiting growth in other types of care um, domains. And it highlights um, winners and losers in, in certain provider sectors. So that is something to keep in mind. Um, it could balance market power um, discrepancies to some degree over time, um, but this would have to be kind of thought through and um, would be articulated in the kinds of rates you would set in expectancy or growth rates. What would this not help us address um, is total spending. It's, it's not as, it's, it's not really, um, it does not have implications really for utilization. Um, and then the sustainability of unregulated providers that would not be helpful unless you were a regulated entity. And this is the most affordable of the three options. And certainly there's variation in the design elements um, as they're, you know, if they were to be further refined and perhaps the regulatory approach, but this seems to be kind of the closest to what we're already doing the hospital budget process if, with, some, with some adjustments. So we can go to the next slide. So as you, you probably know more about the hospital budget process than, than I can lay out here, um, but you know, we'll, at a high level, we'll, we'll go through the history for, for some of um, our other members of the public. So Vermont has um, reviewed and established hospital budget since 1983. Um, in that review, the board is expected to consider local healthcare needs and resources, utilization and quality data, um, hospital administrative costs, and, and you know, lots of other data. Uh, this process, uh, came to the GMCB from Bishka in 2012. Um, these budget reviews occur annually, um, you know, based on July 1 and it begins in October 1, that fiscal year. Um, so there are two key regulatory levers. One is the growth in net patient revenue and, and per fixed perspective payments. Um, and the other is the change in charge, so the increase or decrease in the average gross charges across all payers. Um, but because Medicare and Medicaid are essentially set outside of this process, the impact here is really on, focused on commercial insurers. Okay. Go to the next. Okay. And so Rhode Island um, was another, and I'll let Sarah chime in here. I'll just kind of give the highlights because I think you have some great insights on this one. But, um, you know, they have these affordability standards, which have evolved over the last couple of years. Um, you know, they created a health insurance advisory council in 2004, um, and then they created these new criteria in 2009 um, on the criteria on which to have their premium rates approved, so it's expanding and improving primary care infrastructure, spreading the adoption of patient-centered medical homes, 
uh, supporting the state health information exchange and working towards comprehensive payment reform. And, um, you know, most recently they established these standards. So at least 10.7% of their annual medical spend should be on primary care. And then they tied, um, you know, hospital rate increases to CPI plus 1%. Um, so I'll let Sarah, if you want to add anything on this slide. Um, not a ton to add here. I think you did a great job of summarizing it, Elena, but I, the only thing that I would say is that this, like, what one of the things that makes Rhode Island interesting to me is that they're using the insurance regulation both to impact kind of the provider payments and to set a floor across a whole service type of primary care. Um, so it, it puts it in a, a larger context of kind of a unified approach to improving affordability. Um, and it's been a, a long, a long running strategy with um, with some interesting results. Um, so, Alina, do you have more to say about option two, or should I move us on to option three? I'm gonna pass it to you. All righty. Um, so the last high level option is fee for service rate setting, uh, where the regulator sets reimbursement amounts for each service or procedure at the code level. Uh, so, for example. Um, the, the example that we provide here is, um, you know, E&M e &M code X is paid at $100. Um, most often, uh, this uses an existing payer's reimbursement scheme as the point of reference, most commonly Medicare, because Medicare um, is um, publicly, that the reimbursement amounts and methodologies are publicly available, they're national, they're geographically adjusted, um, so it's, it's significantly more transparent, and we know that that is fairly common. Um, from um, talking to partners and contractors as we developed the report. Um, one of the things that we discuss in, in more detail in the report itself is the option to modify some of the details of Medicare's methodology, for example, site-specific payments, which is something that's come up in Vermont a number of times over the past few years. Um, if we go back to that equation in the background slide that Elena had presented, this option is targeting unit cost, but not utilization, uh, again, which limits its effectiveness in impacting total cost of providing care. Um, this option, um, you know, would, would modify current unit costs, but also, also targets that growth trend. Um, there are two major implementation options here, uh, implementation through provider regulation and through insurance regulation. Um, so what issues could this approach highlight? Um, the benefit of this approach is that it really sets an equal playing field across all providers of a service, balancing out market power concerns um, that, that typically can drive fee-for-service rate setting now. Um, or excuse me, uh, drive fee-for-service um, rate negotiations now. Um, that said, there are also quite a few issues that this approach doesn't address. Uh, it really focuses on unit cost, which we know from other states' experience won't necessarily control total spending. Uh, it also can't take a nuanced look at sustainability since it does not consider individual provider organizations, costs, populations, payer mix, et cetera. Um, and it's not in line with Vermont and the federal government's move toward value-based care and wafer fee-for-service reimbursement. Um, finally, there are likely to be winners and losers in the provider sector, as Elena mentioned with the previous approach, and, and if we increase payment on one service type, we'd have to reduce payment somewhere else, or we'll see costs and premiums rise. Um, finally, I also want to highlight that this is a fairly expensive option uh, with costs of about uh, $600,000 to over $2 million to implement uh, in, in kind of the initial development and implementation stage, and then ongoing costs estimated between $300,000 and nearly a million as well. Um, and the example that we wanted to provide here, uh, as Elena mentioned, Maryland uh, did fee-for-service rate setting for many years, like since the 1970s prior to their um, uh, their uh, global budget approach starting in 2014. Um, Maryland was not alone in this approach for many years. Um, fee-for-service rate setting at the state level, especially for hospitals, was quite common until the 1990s. Um, but Maryland is the only state um, that, you know, was kind of the last state to move away from this. Um, and it's the only state that's exempt from Maryland uh, from Medicare's inpatient prospective payment system and outpatient prospective payment system. Um, so the thing that I want to highlight here is that there was uh, decreased hospital spending per admission, but hospital admissions rose far faster than the national average. So that get, gets back to that point of um, targeting price, but but not being able to control um, total spending. Um, which is why Maryland transitioned to the all-payer global budget model in 2014 and now to their total cost of care approach. I'm gonna hand it back to Elena now to talk about next steps and potential areas for study. Um, 
you know, so depending on what comes next in the legislature, you know, additional additional work or next steps can include exploring these options further and digging into particular model design, you know, particularly for health systems budgets, which was kind of a very general concept, but, you know, each implementation option could look very different and have very different implications for costs and kind of what, um, what uh, you know, pros and cons could be, you know, or what we could affect across the system. Um, and then establishing provider types that are in scope and any other policy objectives would be really important for understanding that further. As we mentioned, you know, the number of providers, what level of detail and what kind of data inputs would affect, you know, all the operational design and costs that would go with that. Um, you know, further study on, on implementation, including robust stakeholder engagement to continue to understand implementation challenges. You know, we'd really have to think about impact on premiums, um, you know, the additional operational costs on providers, and insurers, data requirements, the medic, you know, impact on Medicaid budget, and then, um, you know, varied impact on depending on hospital designation. So critical access already has, you know, cost plus reimbursement, so versus PPS or academic medical centers, these, these uh, policy options might look very different. Um, and then assess other regulatory intersections would be key to ensuring regulatory alignment moving forward. So, you know, certainly with GMCB's uh, hospital sustainability efforts and a companion report due to the legislature this fall, um, you know, some of this will kind of be picked up and dug into in more detail anyway in that report, but there's you know, certainly a lot of work to do there to connect the dots. And then implica implications for um, all payer model total cost of care is another area that would be really important to understand. Um, and then HBO oversight can certainly help resource allocation planning. We'll pause there and see if you have any questions. Oh, just kidding. One more slide. But these are, I'll just summarize quickly. So these are um, kind of key questions back to the back to the legislature that we wanted to pose um, that are, you know, we thought it's a very important question that they're asking, but there are some additional kind of considerations that need to be taken into account, um, which is why we kind of did not feel comfortable making any recommendations um, and why we kind of laid out some policy options. You know, cost containment value-based care have been central to Vermont's health reform strategy, but how should we prioritize, particularly when there might be tensions um, between sustainability, reimbursement, equity, while balancing affordability and access, like we mentioned earlier. Um, and then how should we define sustainability and reimbursement equity? So we, we took a pretty general approach, but there could be some, um, you know, priority setting or particular ways that equity should, would want to be defined that we could take into consideration when further defining some of these options. And then how should Vermont balance provider-led reform with mandatory regulation? So I think this is really important to think about that today. We have really been adopting a provider-led reform model, including payment reform in many um, sense through the ACO. So, you know, we want to recognize that that's our, our starting point. And some of these policy options may deviate um, a little bit depending on how they're designed or a lot um, from, you know, from what, where we are currently. All right, now I'll pass it back to you, Chair Mullen. Apologies. Thank you, Elena. Could you um, go back to uh, the slide in the early 20s that showed the uh, results or outcomes for the Maryland model? So on this last bullet point on this slide, you have so far, Maryland has saved over $45 billion and lowered the rate of cost growth from 25% above the US average to 3% above the average. Is there... Um, something wrong with the uh, grammar here um, because the way I read it is they were growing much faster than the rest of the country so therefore more expensive and they're still growing above the, the national average despite the decades of work that they've done. What am I missing here? I think I yes but I think the 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 value for them, at least, is that they've reduced it from 25% to 3%. So they're they're growing less than they would have been if they didn't have this model. So certainly their work is not finished. And they're actually, they we're talking um, with our team to learn more about how they can think about population health um, and fixed payments, as I mentioned before. But I think, you know, their work is is not done. They did see great results with their hospital readmission rates. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it shows that they've moved the needle, but there's still certainly work to do in Maryland. 
Well, and Elena, um, this is Robin. If I'm, I may be wrong about this, but isn't this their results since 2014? So it doesn't reflect yeah. the, the rate setting approach prior to that? I'm, yes, thank you. Sorry, Robin, I, I missed that. Yeah, so I think it was over the last five years. It was over, we can, we can double check on the time period, but it was a much shorter time span. It wasn't since um, over the, you know, since the 70s, it was more recent than that. In, in the report itself, we included um, kind of references and further reading for, for all of these examples so that we can dig into it a little bit more. Readers can dig into it um, a little bit more. So we can definitely go back in and make sure that that's accurate and provide some more information. Um, my memory is that that came from the evaluation of the original hospital global budget model. So pre, um, uh, you know, pre total cost of care model. It'd be interesting to see what their um, per capita spend is and um, things like that to uh, better understand because it's still, um, if you're selling an apple for $10 and somebody else is selling it for $1, even if you're growing at uh, only 3% above the average, you're still, the cost of that is still growing at, a, at an expensive rate in comparison. So, right. It, it's, and I, I think. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I think one theme to keep in mind here, too, is there's a, there's a difference between growth rates and um, absolute value, right, where you're based, where you're growing from. So I think one thing that's not always um, clear or comparable is, the, is that base rate. Um, so, you know, are, are you an expensive state or facility to begin with? And then what, you know, exactly. there might be... It's like many years ago when the federal government locked in the rates for uh, reimbursement for the VNAs, and Louisiana was like ten thousand dollars higher per capita than the others, and they got locked in at that rate. And how is that fair? You know, so um, just something to consider. Um, members of the board, questions or comments? Uh, yes, Maureen, a couple comments. I mean, first, thank you for doing this very complex. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I think a couple of things. One, you know, what, what Kevin was just talking about, I mean, some of these base off of a cost plus, and we don't know if the costs we're starting at, you know, if they're the most efficient place to begin with. So I, I think that's always something to factor. You know, I'm not sure how we factor it in. It's the way we do the hospital budgets. It's been a challenge. But, you know, when we talk about cost plus, you know, even for all types of providers, um, we don't know what their costs are. And, and uh, that, that's always been a challenge. I think another thing when you talk about the cost estimates and ranges, and some of them are more expensive than others, um, I think the thing there to look at too, though, is, is what's the, you know, is there more opportunity with some of the others? So, it, you know, we may end up costing a lot more to implement, but is there potential for a larger savings or more quality. I don't want to say it's all savings, but just, you know, is there potential for a larger um, amount there? And, you know, I don't know if there's any way to estimate how long it would take to implement these things, you know, so when we talk about the implementation costs and the ongoing operations, is are some of them shorter term to implement, others longer? You know, that might be a factor, but again, we're looking, you know, we want to be in for the long game. So, so, so what's the, the best thing, you know, to look at, at there. And I think, you know, one other thing it doesn't really seem to be addressing is what's the right, um, what's the right level of services throughout the state? And, you know, are we doing, doing too much or too little in certain areas, right? We talk about some of the things that maybe hospitals are doing where they're only doing a few of those services and maybe maybe they shouldn't be doing those and they should be centered at other hospitals. But, you know, really to look at the whole system collectively and not sure how we factor that in, but uh, a, a big, big project here all the way around. So, so thank you though, but those are just a few comments. Thank you, Maureen. Other members of the board? Sure, I'll, I'll pick up on a little bit of what Maureen was saying. I agree. Um, it would be helpful to understand the, the time horizon, um, the time horizon of the impact, the ROI. 
all of those things. And I know this was this was just a first pass at a very, very complicated question. So I thank the entire team for doing this. I think there's so much work to consider here. I think um, I think it's slide 30. Can you go to slide 30 for a second, Sarah? Yeah, to me, uh, that second bullet point, how should Vermont define sustainability and re reimbursement equity? I think you were right to put this on here as, you know, putting it back to the legislature to help us think about what how we define that. You know, I think sustainability generally implies generating enough revenue to cover costs, right, and maintain a margin for capital investment in rainy days. But I think we really need to dig deeper in what we mean by sustainability and, in particular, what we mean by costs. So, you know, it may not be the current costs that we're seeing right now if the system has fee-for-service driven inefficiencies embedded within it, right? If there's an abundance of, if there's excess capacity in places or if there's care that's being delivered at high cost and low quality, right? So to me, I think about sustainability as meaning generating enough revenue to ensure that there's access in our communities to high value cost-effective care delivered in a timely way in an appropriate setting. And when we think about that definition of sustainability, that's going to require a much deeper analysis to ensure that we have that sustainability, because then we have to figure out what are those essential services, what does access mean, what is cost effective care, all of that. So really complicated makes it even, you know, makes that whole calculus much more complicated. Um, and I think the same thing true when I think about reimbursement equity, equity, you know, generally implies fairness. So what is fair? Um, and I think you've raised some of these important questions. Is it paying providers the same price for the same service? You have to consider other factors there. Is it paying you know, providers based on the cost of delivery? We don't know the cost of delivery. In many cases, the providers themselves don't know the cost of delivery. We've heard from many hospitals that they don't even have you know, cost accounting systems. Um, certainly independent providers don't. So it gets tricky. And costs can vary for a whole host of reasons, right? So would we want to have higher payments to compensate for higher quality or greater patient acuity, right? That might work, but then we have to be able to measure that. And um, when we think about, you know, higher costs just based on or higher reimbursements based on costs, is that rewarding and efficiency? I don't know. We're not. It's going to be very challenging to tell that. And I even think about payer mix being so important. Would you pay two providers the same amount if one... Um, you know, it was open to all comers, including Medicaid patients, and another one says, I'm not going to accept Medicaid patients, right? Do they get reimbursed the same amount? And I think those are all such important things to consider. So this is only to say that I think how we define sustainability and how we define equity here is going to be so important for how we move forward with designing policies that will improve both. So really, really good work and so much work to be done here. And I appreciate all the you know, nuances here that you've raised, because I think it's complicated. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow up on that, that uh, this, um, as I was uh, reviewing these slides and, and reading the report before that, this all reminded me a little bit about um, all the moving parts that were in education and property tax reform, you know, back in the 90s, and it never, you know, everybody always had their little kind of marginal plan until the Amanda Brigham decision came along, uh, and it was uh, uh, um, um, Brigham versus State Board of Education, and all of a sudden there was a Supreme Court ruling that basically upended the state's um, uh, system of, of educating its children. And the key phrase in that Supreme Court decision was equal access to educational opportunity. And so when I uh, was reading the page that uh, Jess has called up here, I just substituted the words equal access to preventive and remedial care. You know, if we could just get a Supreme Court to kind of mandate that, then a lot of these uh, uh, interacting forces um, uh, uh, would be would would get resolved in a, in a short period of time. Um, I mean, back back then, the court decision came out February fifteenth, and the by June we had a uh, uh, Act sixty, which was imperfect, but it it started the ball rolling to long-term reform. Um, I was kind of struck between uh, a sentence or a phrase on page, slide 29 that said, depending on legislative direction, and then going to this slide, the next page, um, where it says cost containment and value-based care are central to Vermont's health reform strategy. And there's, a, there's a, a gap between those two statements. 
And I'm just wondering if there are things that we and DIVA can do um, to kind of move this, you know, in, in, in important ways from a narrative presentation, which is very complex and, and very well done, but to one that is, um, for example, addressing the issue that Jess raised, um, like uh, the, the payer mix. Um, it is striking, so striking to me always that in the 2020 report that um, the budget people presented to us earlier, earlier this year for the five-year trends, we see that, um, that for over that five-year period from 2016 through 2020, that the total net uh, operating margin across all hospitals was $221.2 million. And that of that, 216.2 million were was accrued by UVM Medical Center, not the network, just the medical center, which is 97.7 percent of all net operating margin. I mean, to me, that's a fantastic statistic that strikes at the issue of payer mix, given that UVM Medical Center has the best payer mix, and you compare that to someone like Springfield that has the worst. And one is complaining about their margin, but the other went bankrupt. Um, so, you know, I, I'm just wondering if there are things that we can do, like doing some analysis on the payer mix to kind of give it more granularity in terms of, of its impact so we can inform the legislature and ourselves in that regard. Um, can we do more in terms of price transparency? We have two bodies of information out there now. One is our own um, uh, in terms of our A-team um, doing work on price transparency, but also this federally mandated CMS data, which some reporters are using now in the news media. We're getting letters from individual citizens that, that are using that data. So we have Auditor Hoffer out there saying, you know, this is an issue of, of scale and monopoly and bargaining power. You know, is that true or is that not? And can we, um, you, know, for, you know, kind of you know, give some more detail to that by looking at, at, at the price transparency data? Um, or FPP, you know, there, um, you know are, are, there, are there pieces of this that we can reduce the narrative to actual analysis, you know, that, that will help us? Uh, you know, even maybe going through the, this year's rate review process and hospital budget process, so that's that's you know that this narrative presentation is wonderful. It's a great job and incredibly hard to write, I would think, because it is a narrative. Um, and but there's 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 got to be some things that we can do, you know, on an analytical level to kind of give these options kind of better shape. Um, and certainly, if we had a Supreme Court decision like the Amanda Brigham decision, uh, we, we'd get to it a, a lot faster. But um, um, you know, that, that decision was incredibly complicated, too. You had incomes by school district, you had different grand lists, you had rural versus urban schools. You know, I, I learned that up in the Northeast Kingdom, they spend 1700 bucks, you know, per child to get them to just to get them to school. And in Burlington, it was 52 bucks per child. So there's all these moving parts that aren't always obvious that, that we're, you know, an analytical approach well, but Great job, and, and uh, thank you very much for this. And I was going to go next, Kevin, if, unless go you ahead, like. Go ahead, Robin. Yeah, so thank you to Sarah and Elena and the team who worked on the report. Um, I've been in the legislature with them, but uh, I was happy to see them take the lead today. So I had a couple of things that I uh, that I've been thinking about as we approach as we've been having the legislative conversation, obviously, you know, due to the nature of the legislation, we did take a neutral approach in terms of presenting all of the options. But I do think that there are some low hanging fruit for improving the existing regulatory processes. Um, these things would not necessarily result in uh, kind of the big shifts that people have been talking about and certainly, um, wouldn't fix all the problems there are out there. As we said, there are a lot of trade-offs and, and contradictions. But I think if the board wanted to heighten its affordability viewpoint and framework, uh, there are ways to do that using the, the provider reimbursement 
uh, setting the provider reimbursement policy option, so option two. Um, particularly, I think we could look at how that might get, um, how we could refine our current process around hospital charges to think about how to make that more nuanced and to uh, points that people have already raised, think about the base better, think about what, you know, what the price is uh, for each individual hospital and have a more nuanced understanding of that. Um, and I think that could be a way to do that. And while it certainly does not impact a ton of people when you're thinking about the whole system, um, looking at what Rhode Island has done around reimbursement policy uh, I think could enhance the the affordability considerations that we currently look at in rate review, which I think are, um, at least for me, are somewhat frustrating because we have this very narrow kind of window to look at affordability within the context of the actuarial parameters. So um, while that doesn't change the world, it could uh, enhance, I think, the rate review process. Similarly, I think, um, looking at how to move forward with fixed payments. Uh, to me, that's that's a bigger issue because it's a conversation around, um, are we still all in with provider-led reform, which then lends itself to a lighter regulatory touch and more of a review and not a directive? Um, or do we feel like we as a state need to move forward with more of a directive? And if that's the case, then I think our existing processes could be used to uh, kind of look at how that FPP implementation um, could could move forward in a, a more state-led way, I would say. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, you know, I haven't made up my mind in terms of what the, the right or the wrong way to move forward should the legislature want to or should we want to promote an option. Um, but to me, those are the areas that I think are would be baby steps and would both improve the existing processes, um, not have a price tag that probably kills it at the legislature, and um, could also uh, move a little bit into um, considering these issues more broadly than we currently are able to do with our regula regulatory framework. Thank you, Robin, and, and uh, um, I too want to thank uh, um, Elena and Sarah for their hard work, but I especially want to give a shout out for the, on behalf of the other members of the board to Robin, who um, tirelessly worked on this project and has um, accompanied the team to the legislative uh, presentations and um, has really owned this work. So thank you, Robin, and thank you, Sarah and Elena. At this point, I'm going to open it up for public comment or questions. And I see Walter Carpenter has his hand up. Walter. So I still don't hear you, Walter. So I'm going to move to the next person, but come back to you afterwards. So, um, Rick Dooley. Hey, thanks so much for the for the presentation, the information. And as I'm sure everyone is aware, you know, Health First has been, you know, trumpeting these issues in terms of reimbursement sustainability for, you know, several years now, uh, going back even before certainly uh, the formation of the ACO. Um, I just want to say that in the I think it was option two, there were a couple times. Um, that you just referenced, you know, increases in primary care spending, you know, one of the detriments of the plan was that that would have to come from somewhere else, that it would, there would have to be an offset. And I just wanted to point out that that's exactly the point. Um, that's what we're trying to do. That's what um, all the studies show that we should do. That's what the, um, you know, some of the Rhode Island program does. It is exactly that shifting into primary care to reduce costs in other places. So. Um, I don't see that as a detriment or as a problem with the with uh, a particular model. And again, we're not endorsing any particular model. You know, like Robin, this is incredibly dense with a lot of information, and it's impossible to really to point to one and say this is the you know this is Eureka, the solution that solves it all. But um, I think it is important to remember that primary care you know was the basis of the all payer model, the basis of the ACO, and is the basis of healthcare reform. So I think we need to keep that in mind that increased spending is going to come from someplace else, and that's okay. That's that's the goal. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. 
Um, I'll try again with Walter, Walter Carpenter. All right, Kevin, it was a mute issue. Okay. As usual. <laughs> um, hey, I was born in the age of record players and phones with cords on them. I'm still trying to get this stuff down. You're not um, the only one. Yeah, the uh, I want to kind of back up what Jen and Tom said, and I like Tom's idea of a of a court resolution or court decision on a lot of this stuff. I think he's more or less got it there. And I remember when he brought up education, I remember that I had re emigrated to Vermont from New Hampshire around that time and New Hampshire's towns were going bankrupt because of the education funding down there and suing the state. And I remember I was astonished that people were complaining about what was going on with education in those days. But anyway, I want to know that with all this, this dense complexity that we're going and sustainability and accountability, how <clears throat> we can do this or something because the people that pay for this are us and we're the ones that don't understand if you're not involved in it don't understand how this stuff really works and I just ask that when we think of this when we do this and look at this we think of the people that pay for it and I know that the board is stuck between that rock and a hard place but I just wanted to re-emphasize that Thank you, Walter. And, and uh, just as a reminder to everyone, simplicity uh, of the system was a, a major driver of um, Act 48. Yeah. I'm not so sure that it's gotten any simpler. <laughs> <laughs> it, so with that, it hasn't, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> with that, I'm going to go to Ham Davis. Ham? Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I've got a couple of questions, but I'll start out with this one. I'm curious, I'd ask Sarah, um, the, I'm very interested in, in Maryland. I think Maryland and Vermont are the yin and the yang of trying to figure out how to do all of this. And one of the things, I, that if I understand Maryland correctly, is that they've done is that they've, um, he's, they've aligned the uh, payment levels for various things across, uh, across all payers. What I wonder about that is, and I wonder because they, even though they've done that, their their state costs are still very high. Have they? Did they? Were they, were they able to do that? In other words, I think that means that they eliminated the cost shift. And if that's the case, they would have had to eliminate it by possibly by getting more money uh, for things like Medicaid from the state legislature and possibly more money from Medicare from the federal government. Is that? how they did it. In other words, and we've already found out, Kevin found this out a couple of years ago, and he politely suggested to the legislature they should make, pay more for, my, for Medicaid payments, and, and it didn't get a friendly reception. I'm just wondering, is that is that is that the engine that is driving Maryland? Um, Pam, this is a link. I, I, I think they, they never had a cost shift problem, so they kept up with it, and then as they um, implemented these, you know, various evolutions of the of their fee for service rate setting into global budgets. You know that parity in payment was carried forward. So that is one difference. Is where you know we and many other states are starting from a very different place. You know, when we when we do in fact have a cost shift, if we, you know, made it a policy goal to have some equity across payers, that would have to be certainly you know funding would have to come from somewhere and and be structured over, you know, a period of time. Thanks for that, Elena. I, I'm curious. I, I I don't think that 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 cost shift was. I think that cost shift in Maryland was present back in what for me anyway is just recent history, which is to say 1990s. Now that may be not recent for you, but it's recent for me. Um, anyway, but that may be right. I, I I so I thank you for that. I'd like to just check that out. I I I don't think that there was anybody in the 1980s and the 1990s. That had no cost, no uh, cost shift at all. At least, I, at least I didn't know that. I think that Maryland is the modern Maryland is is different. But anyway, the my. Can I just 
them in, Ham, to, to talk about that. So they do technically have a small cost shift because they discount the fee for service rates that they were setting for both Medicare and Medicaid by, I think it's like somewhere between five and 10%. So there is a small cost shift. Um, but And we can certainly look into that. But my recollection from our last conversation with Maryland is that because they did it kind of all payer starting in the 70s, uh, they didn't have a big catch up. But we can certainly, um, you could certainly look at the resources or, you know, we could take another look at that. Well, thanks, Robin. I, but I, that's, I, I don't think it needs a lot of work to be done here. I'm just curious about that because uh, because the, the, the cost shift is a huge irritant for all kinds of reasons. Say Kevin tried to take a crack at it with that letter of the legislature a couple of years ago. Um, so anyway, I'm just, I, I just think that that's, if you build a solution that requires a big, whatever your solution you build, if you build something that is going to require the legislature to do something affirmatively and spend a lot of money, then the chances of it happening are not good. I have one other question. Can I ask one more question, Kev? Go ahead, Ian. Um, one of the things that strikes me uh, in, in all of this discussion, and we've been doing this now for many years and so forth, but one of the things that strikes me is that the is that the the, what, the, the whole enterprise, everybody, the legislature, the regulatory structure, the, the law, so forth, all is uh, is aimed at, is, it looks at the Vermont delivery system although as though it was a fairly uniform thing. And I think it isn't. I mean, I think that the way that the University of Vermont works is just, just the university hospital itself. I'm not talking about the rest of the network, just the university hospital. But for forever i mean for all my experience back beginning back in the 80s the uh, what the, the 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 way that they way the university of vermont deals with money is that they pay their their doctors a salary um, and they pay their doctor they pay their doctors a salary um, they do not essentially function on a fee for service basis within the hospital they don't do that okay that's very different from, I believe, all the other hospitals with the exception of Dartmouth, but they're not willing to play anyway. So what, I'm, what, makes, what makes no sense to me is, is that you can, the, the, uh, the reality is, the reality is if you treat, if you want to treat a system, if you want to treat a hospital, two hospitals, you, have, you basically have two hospital systems. One, 50% of it is UVM. And the 13 others, uh, the other half, and those other hospitals really are functioning on a fee-for-service basis internally. UVM is not focusing on it internally. And so when you try and compare them, and they, they, they you know, the Senate Health and Welfare, I mean, Senate Finance in, in 2018 spent half a session trying to figure out how they could make Blue Cross pay the same Fee for service um, uh, rate for a doctor's office, a doc, doctor's office visit between the two things, and it just doesn't work because the University of Vermont doesn't pay people that way. So if you want to get, you say we have have to have equity across all sites. So we want to pay everybody the same, irrespective of the site. The sites are different. You Burlington is very different from North Country, and if you want, to, and so. It seems to me that it makes no sense to try and, and to try and treat them exactly the same. That's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ham. Next, I'm going to go to Mort Wasserman. Mort. Thanks. Uh, I am totally in awe of the team that put this report together um, because the uh, situation is so complex. I was just trying to uh, muse about some overarching principles that could be applied here, and then question those question those very overarching principles. In in uh, healthcare, there's this principle: uh, first, do no harm. Uh, so, thing I would first consider is doing nothing an option, and I would probably answer that by saying, no, it's not an option because sustaining uh, the current system that is so poorly put together and so distorted uh, is, is just not an option. 
the second thing that occurred to me was using the principles of value-based care while leaving quality completely out of the value equation strikes me as dangerous. So that if you have to leave quality out, you'd better try to imagine what distortions will be introduced that will in fact um, <clears throat> affect quality. It would be nice to move from anything based on fee for service, and yet I see service type and fee current fees, unit costs being the basis for many of the possible ways to alter things. Uh, that seems to be um, moving away from population health goals. The notion of provider type is so broad, the way we use it, a provider, as far as I can tell, is any one or thing that sends a bill, which encompasses the small solo and three person practices going all the way from that to the health network. So uh, maybe that that notion itself should be questioned. Uh, so finally, I would just say whatever decisions are made or whatever is put into place, if the legislature chooses to put something into place, will result in distortions and will uh, create harm. And it would be good to anticipate those harms as uh, much as can be possible so that one can consider how to address uh, the damage that is done when you reform the system. That's so it. I will just, oh, sorry, more. I just wanted to comment on, those are very helpful uh, comments and, and we did think about quality um, in a robust sense, but for the purposes of our timeline, we're unable to kind of weave it in here as explicitly we, as we wanted, but it was uh, definitely feedback we gave to the legislature that, you know, if you are really going to dig into value-based care, that is absolutely something um, that needs to be layered into each of these options. And, and I don't, you know, I think in the actual report, if you look in the full report, we do talk about um, that a little bit. Like some of these options are more amenable to kind of a, a value-based care or quality focus. And some of them, you know, it's not, um, at odds with, but it wouldn't have the same kind of complementary aspect as, you know, for example, like global budgets are trying, trying you know, really set up to have those quality components, um, particularly in the Maryland and the Pennsylvania models. Um, but that's certainly an area that warrants further research. Um, and then as for the provider type, you know, that's something that we I, tried to call out in, in the full body of the report that that certainly needs uh, further refinement if we're really going to understand how to design and implement any of these strategies. Could, could I also add to that? Or Robin, it looked like you were about to jump into. You go ahead, Sarah. Okay. Um, I was just going to say that from my perspective, I think quality could potentially be layered onto any of these, um, on, onto any of these models, um, whether that looks like something like, um, you know, a health system budget, as Elena mentioned, where it's um, really kind of like part of the fabric, or whether it's something that's built on top, like, um, you know, a, a pay for performance or or quality withhold or something like that. You know, there are things that we can do to layer different models on top. And as we said, the report itself is like, um, you know, 100 slides because there's so there's so much complexity that we that we did dig into and that we could dig into. Um, the other thing that I want to highlight is when we talk about those, you know, potential distortions um, in the report itself, which goes deeply into the the eight kind of sub options uh, that I'm projecting up on the screen right now. Um, we do include pros and cons for each of those options. So we've tried to kind of highlight some of those distortions where we can already see them. But one of the things that we are thinking about as we propose areas for further study um, and, and as we kind of ask the legislature for a direction on, on where to go next is um, making sure that we would be identifying those distortions in advance and, and doing the analytic work um, prior to and doing the policy work prior to to think about um, how how the um, how how changing the incentives will um, or how changing payment will change the incentives and could impact quality. Okay, is there other public comment? Ham, is your hand up again? 
Yes, sir. I'd just like to ask whether you're going to make a, a recommendation among these options, Kevin. Uh, at this point, we haven't been asked to make a recommendation, Ham. Okay. I, I mean, I, okay. Thank you. Other public comment? Kevin, this is Mark. Go ahead, Mark. So, you know, these are just some thoughts to um, well to share as you think about this. But if we are truly talking about how how do we make healthcare costs affordable in the state of Vermont for Vermonters, it has to have some component tied to the total cost of care. It really, really does. Um, um, and I'm obviously just sharing my opinion here. So, you know, um, and in that spirit, there are some topics, there are, you know, two topics in particular that, that I didn't hear discussed that has, that, that is going to have a big impact on, on cost of care to Vermonters, our aging population, you know, that's going to have a impact on the cost of care. So like, once again, I, I go back to the total cost of care. If we're serious about this, you know, you know, you know, we really need to look at the total cost of care. Um, and, and then the other thing that Vermont exports a lot of care too. So once again, that comes back to the total cost of care and how do we balance those? And, and, and then the fourth point, um, you know, there's been some, um, you know, throughout this conversation, you know, in these examples, there's been some reference to we need to take dollars from one to take, well, to give to the other to balance out. And, and you know, at least I think if we have an effective reform process, there's probably going to be a higher cost at first, candidly. And the reward comes from lowering utilization, lowering unit cost, and that reward is later down the road and the cost curve is much less. So, you know, I would just kind of share that because, you know, um, I, I mean, I can't speak to how good our system is today or how imperfect it is today, but, you know, if you're just moving around the dollars, it makes it seem like you're transfer, you know, you're just changing, you know, one challenge for another challenge. And if, and if reform, and I mean health reform, not regulatory reform, health reform is done well. It comes from lowering utilization down the road. So, you know, so I would just put that out there as we think about these things. And it's obviously a complicated issue, but, but you know, um, you know um, so, you know, those are just, you know, some thoughts that hit me um, as I was listening to the presentation. And, I would just, you know, share for a very complicated discussion. I thought the staff went through it very well too. Thank you, Mark. Next is Eric Schulteis. Eric. Hi, Kevin. Um, I just have uh, two comments. I guess they're not really about this report. One is, um, if the board has seen more and more a substantial number of comments about the hospital procedure price transparency um, disclosures. Um, I think it might be worth asking um, the board and the HCA and the hospitals to work together to try to figure out how to best tell consumers what you can and cannot do with it. So I think having talked with the board about this and I guess three hospitals, I think we're in a rather surprising amount of agreement about what can and cannot be said with this data. And I think, uh, you know, if the hospital's approach to the disclaimers isn't working, it is a, something that needs to be addressed so that we can try to head off um, the worst confusion because it could be misused. Um, and then the other item is I would uh, like to introduce uh, Sam. He's took over Julia's role. He uh, is a graduate of Middlebury College in Poli Sci, uh, recently graduated from with his MPH from the T.F. Chan School of Public Health, um, both 
roughly three years before then, and then during his time uh, at Harvard, he was working at the Harvard Center for um, Health and Human Rights. And I'm sure everyone will be seeing a fair amount of him in the upcoming years. Can Sam go on camera so we can see who he is? Nice to meet everyone. Thanks so much, Eric. There he is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, other public comment. Walter. Uh, hey, Kevin, I just wanted to make a comment here when we talk about utilization. I thought the purpose of a healthcare system was utilization and not lower utilization. Lower utilization translates into claim denials, translates into deductibles, which are made to stop people from using the healthcare system. So I asked us to think about that. I'm a victim of claim denials. I know very well what they're like. I just had to fight one this year, and I'm even on Medicare now. It's a good point, Walter, but there are... Um a number of studies that point to unnecessary utilization as well. So you have both problems. You have um, people being denied proper utilization, but you also have um, improper utilization um, that doesn't result in a better result. So it's about getting the right care at the right time in the right setting and making sure that that care is coordinated and um, making sure that it's early enough so that it doesn't become the more expensive care. So it's a very complex situation when it comes to utilization. Nobody's trying to deny utilization because that uh, goes against our aims of quality and access. Um, but at the same time, you have to recognize that um, there is room for improvement in the system. Other public comment? Hearing none, once again, I want to thank the team for uh, a great discussion this afternoon and uh, um, a lot of interesting uh, uh, points were raised and uh, hopefully the legislature is digesting what you presented to them and uh, we'll move forward from there. Oh, did I miss someone? No, I guess somebody just wasn't muted. With that, I'm going to go to, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed signify by saying nay. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.